day one of Toei Month, where I will review each of these Toei films chronologically throughout the month, starting with The Legend of White Snake, the first coloured anime based on the Chinese fable of the same name. Now this is where Toei began its role of trying to become the Disney of the East. And you can kind of see that through the design, which is close to Snow White with a more Eastern tinge. And, you know, it also has a lot of those cute animals which were staples of Disney's as support characters. In fact, you could say they run the film to some degree. Now, what's special about Legend of the White Snake is that it was mainly key animated by two people. Daikuhara, who's the grandpa of Toei Animation, he's been working since the 30s, and he did most of the human characters. And Yasuji Mori, who's like the godfather of anime, works with a lot of simple animations with lots of dainty flowing movement. His job was the animal characters. And these two pretty much did most of the key animation for the whole film. There was at least a couple, and we're talking 30 to 20 in between us as well. Some of them became staples of the industry later, like Otsuka, who was the new boy, and eventually would go on to mentor Miyazaki. He worked on the catfish during the film. And speaking of Miyazaki, this is the film that really got him into animation to begin with. He was so inspired by it, perhaps unhealthily uh, transfixed. The main female character sort of became his muse, or... Uh, yeah, yeah, let's not go there. But you can certainly see a lot of these themes and narrative ideas from Legend of the White Snake ending up in Ponyo. It may have uh, helped shape that film more than even The Little Mermaid did. Now, the designs do have this Disney tinge to them, but they do have their own sort of style. Some of my personal favourites within the film would be the sly animal characters. I'm not even sure what it is about them, but I just like looking at them. It's really nice. Thumbs up there. And certainly one of the highlights would be the animation of Yusuji Mori. When he goes to town, he goes to town. He excels throughout the film, especially in any of the dragon-related scenes and the one particular fight with the panda. It starts to feel like a Tom and Jerry cartoon, but very well done. And musically, we have a very Chinese traditional score, but with the mixing of more American techniques like the Mickey Mousing, where they accentuate the movements of all the characters with musical flourishes. But at the same time, we can tell the growing pains of the company as the lip syncing isn't very good in so in fact, it's pretty terrible, especially in the musical scenes. And this is where we get to other problems within the film, like the narrative, which is flimsy and meandering. And the plot is treated secondary to the slice of life activities, which I wasn't really expecting. We spent about 26 minutes moseying on until any kind of major plot point happens. Once more, neither of the leads have strong characterization. The male Hu Shen is the blankest slate you could possibly be. And the romance between him and Bai Ni doesn't have much time to bloom, despite it being the main premise the film is based on. Later on, Bai Ni gives up her immortality for this guy, which should be a profound statement, but the film never even told me that she was immortal to begin with. And it really doesn't mean much in the context, because there was no stakes built up that that was something that was important to her, or that something related to their relationship. Now, the biggest problem around this as a whole is that it's just full of forced conflict. When it's sort of going on its own pace and meandering, it's quite a comfy experience. But when you get scenes where a like, paper dragon comes alive and leads the animals into a misadventure where they steal some pendants, and that crime gets pinned on that master, and then he's taken away as a slave. As the main fuel of the conflict in this film, it, it feels very contrived. Buying Ni kind of just leaves and mopes for a while. She doesn't really try and help him out, even though later on in the film you can see she has like cosmic magical powers, which would have definitely been handy like 20 minutes ago. But I digress. And what's worse, the antagonist, Lord Hokai, has no reason really to do anything he's doing. Like, I don't understand his relationship with the main boy. Or what he's even getting out of this. He has no stakes within their relationship. I don't understand why he's trying so hard to separate these two. He just seems like this fat beardy guy who just hates snakes and wants to put a damper on everyone. I will say overall, it's a very comfy and pleasant experience until about the last third of the story. And would I recommend this film? Um, yeah, I guess so. If you want to see where Color Anime started, and it does have some highlights, especially when it comes to its animation and its lighter moments. But if you're going to watch this, you should definitely watch Ponyo too, because that really nails down a lot of the issues this film had and improves upon them. So yeah, pretty cool. <laughs>